Marks underscore the issue of oxygen availability as critical to the success of case management. There is an ongoing review of the chain for the supply of medical oxygen for our medical facilities across the nation. While we work on immediate measures, we wish to express our appreciation to Mr. Raj Gupta and the Abuja Steel Mills for bringing or for bridging the gap in oxygen requirements in Abuja with at least 100 cylinders of medical oxygen daily for the next three months as part of the contributions of car COVID. We are also grateful to the Nigerian Air Force for logistic support and supply of oxygen to health sector in the last nine months. They have consistently come to our aid whenever we have experiences of shortages of cylinders of oxygen and also ferry them across the nation from their locations in Yola and other places to our medical facilities. I now invite the Honorable Minister of State Health and thereafter followed by the DG of NCDC who would update you from the technical perspective. And I thank you all for listening and thank you for everything you are doing in spite of the fact that we are in a holiday mood you ought to be enjoying the season but we keep calling you out here so that we can keep Nigerians fully informed of what we are doing in the presidential task force and also avail them with information where they would assess the risk that is glaring confronting them in their response personal response to fighting this pandemic thank you and have a good evening thank you very much um, the chairman of ptf my colleagues on the PTF, our CMDs from the various hospitals here in uh, Abuja, and of course the Health Secretary of Health in Abuja, media representative, the team ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just a quick update on where we are. As at today, the 29th December of 2020, the total sample tested is 937,712, while the number of confirmed cases is 84,811. The active cases number 12,190 while discharges till date stands at 71,357 and sadly the number of deaths till date is 1,264 while the case fatality is 1.49 percent. You recall that uh, our case fatality of 1.49, in spite of increasing number of active cases, as well as the morbidity that we have seen, is still an evidence of uh, scaled up activities and quality of care in our isolation centers. And all our federal tertiary hospitals that run at levels two and three isolation centers, they have been 
directed to improve and scale up infection prevention and control measures in order to improve on treatment outcomes and enhance safety of the frontline health workers. This is coming at the backdrop of the recent upsurge in the affected health workers and the sad loss of some. The case management has continued to advocate for the presence of our psychosocial support for both patients and health workers. This is necessary because of fatigue and uh, consequential apathy associated with the pandemic. I think it's also important for me to say at this juncture that um, our experience here in Nigeria is such that we hardly need to make use of ventilators. That is not to say that we are indicated we will not use ventilators. But rather what we have done and what we have seen our people respond to most of the time is uh, delivering oxygen through oxygen concentrators. And this is what has uh, buttressed the need for us to ensure that our oxygen plants are functional. And where we have established gaps, either because of non-functionality of some oxygen plants or where they do not even exist, we need to put this in place. That is ensuring that the oxygen plants are functional and where we did, they do not exist, we ensure that we establish so that we can make oxygen available as a very potent factor in patient management. So we're doing everything in that regard, as alluded to by the chairman of the PTF. visiontv.co.uk and click on entertainment then NTAI you can also download the iOS or Android app on your mobile devices to watch NTA International on the go anywhere in the world NTA International your window to the world I am here to talk about facts. There is so much misinformation and distortion out there, especially on the social media. All it takes is just a click and the fake news goes viral. 
Hi, we're here on NTU. We deal with facts. My job is to go out there and come for factual news and information, just the way it is, all in the interest of the nation. I'm Naja Atutijani. Beyond the NCA, we present only the facts, verified. Beware of fake news, don't be a victim. Stay tuned to the NCA. Especially at this time of the coronavirus pandemic. My name is Namde Ojiko. and most efficient way to avoid getting infected is through regular hygienic and sanitary practices as well as social distancing. As individuals, we remain the greatest weapon to fight this pandemic. By washing our hands regularly with clean water and soap, disinfecting frequently used surfaces and areas, cutting into a tissue or elbow and strictly adhering to infection prevention control measures in health facilities, we can contain this virus. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, Information management is key. I'm Cyril Stover. Fatima Umar Buba. Joseph Johnson. Ian Ray John. Muhammad Kudu Abubakar. Jumwe Yusuf. My name is Kirian Umayo. Here in NCA, we're working very hard to make sure that everything we broadcast is accurate and up to date. Misinformation spreads very fast. The social media has been a huge conveyor of misleading information from one individual to another, then to another set of groups. In a short while it goes viral and before you know it it is all over the world there have been several misleading information on coronavirus COVID-19 recently the misconception of 5g as a cause of coronavirus is becoming widespread another is the belief that hot beverages and alcoholic drinks are internal cleanser for COVID-19 thereby leading to excessive consumption of these drinks the use of local concoctions as strict for COVID-19 are yet to be scientifically proven. However, there has been several theories about the efficacies of these concoctions. We should stay safe and denounce all manner of fake news and misleading information on COVID-19. For medical advice, go on the WHO website, Nigeria Center for Disease Control, NCDC website, or stick with the advice raised from the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 or other authentic official sources. NCA is one of them. Star Show Entertainment. Look at us. No one saw this coming. Some of us say the world is ending. I don't have good news for you. We just faced the worst week since we started responding to this outbreak. We had more cases in Nigeria last week than in any other previous week since the beginning of this outbreak. Just looking at pictures and images and videos from across the country is a very disheartening situation because it appears that our messaging, our appeals to Nigerians over the last few months have not been heeded. And we have gone around 
we've gone ahead with business as usual. Event centers are full. Social facilities are full. So it is no surprise that cases are rising. January will be a tough month. No doubt about it. January will be a tough month, so we have to brace ourselves for the consequences of the activities that we have decided to carry out in December. Our colleagues, the CMDs, are here today because of the pressures that we face across the country. Our treatment centers are filling up. We're struggling to keep up. We're struggling to find the facilities to manage, the oxygen to manage. Every night we're faced with phone calls of patients desperate for care. So unfortunately, January will be a tough month for all of us. It will be tough, but we still have an opportunity to do what we need to do. We've been liaising with the governors of, executive governors of states across the country to be more purposeful in implementing the measures that we have agreed on collectively. And we have seen some of them doing that. But many of the states in the country haven't and pretend as if there will be no consequence. This is the reality we face, so we've got to brace ourselves for January. The other challenge that we're facing, apart from the challenge of the outbreak, is an increasing outbreak of misinformation. Every day we receive broadcast messages on WhatsApp, people sending forth messages that are unsubstantiated and in fact wrong. Not just wrong, they're unethical, some of them are simply unbelievable. But we feel somehow an impulse to send them on with the clause there sent, that sent as received. This causes harm. It causes harm because the more we send it off, the more people believe. Yesterday a message was circulating all over Nigeria, apparently sent by a distinguished senator of the Federal Republic. I called up this senator yesterday. He had not written anything, he had not said anything. He was surprised when I sent him something apparently signed by himself. He had to respond as best he could, but by then, this message had circulated in Nigeria, circulated in the diaspora, and was being sent back by Nigerians living across the world to us here in Nigeria. So please, this is an appeal. Even when a message seems somehow legitimate and somehow signed off by somebody you know, or you think you know, it may not be that person. It's not very difficult these days to put someone's name at the bottom of a WhatsApp message and let it uh, circulate. So please, not everything you read on WhatsApp is true. In fact, probably most of it is not. Like the chair said, uh, there is a new variant circulating in the UK, but like we've said several, there are new variants of viruses appearing all the time. The question is whether this new variant is associated with any increase in transmission or severity. Uh, we don't know that yet. We suspect that this variant is already in Nigeria. It would be surprising if it is not. But we simply don't know yet. So what we are doing are collecting samples of recently diagnosed cases and working to do the sequencing that needs to do, we need to do in order to verify if this variant exists in Nigeria or not. So that's work that is ongoing. It will take us a couple of weeks to have enough samples to analyze and to then define whether we have this new variant or not. So that's where we are. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization is leading in a, a more global assessment of how um, prevalent this new variant is and whether it is actually associated with increased transmission in other countries uh, in the world. So finally, uh, just a few updates on the response. I really want to thank healthcare workers across the country that even as we're speaking, even in the facilities that my colleagues here manage across the federal capital and across the country, in the National Reference Lab today and every day of the year, there are people working very hard 
uh, have spent their Christmas New Year working on behalf of all of us. And we're very grateful to all of them for the hard work uh, that you're carrying out for the country. Um, this afternoon, uh, many of us uh, have met here and also meeting, focusing on various other aspects of the response. The leader, uh, my brother, the director, executive director of the National Primary Health Care Development Agency, is also leading in very hard, working hard to make sure that 2021 is really the year that we can make vaccines available to fight this disease. But the reality is that we will not have access to these vaccines um, immediately, and we have to work hard with what the tools that we do have right now to prevent more cases and more deaths. Uh, finally, I really want to thank all of you, gentlemen, and ladies of the press for the support you have provided us through the year, uh, for your reporting, your engagement, and uh, your work on behalf of the country. We're very grateful. Um, you are the connection that we have with Nigerians. Uh, thank you very much for your diligence, even during this very uh, difficult period of the year and a time where you should, should all be resting. Uh, thank you very much for your hard work and your support through the year. I wish you a very good end of the year, uh, 2020, and all of us a better 2021. Thank you very much. Thanks immensely, the DG and CDC, for your passionate plea to Nigerians to adhere to those non-pharmaceutical initiatives. Well, uh, due to the demand from some of our viewers, there is a need for this message to reach particularly our Hausa uh, listener and viewer. So it's my pleasure at this time to invite the Honorable Minister of the Government to please drive on the message. Mr. Chairman, members of PTF, our distinguished guests, the medical directors, Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen of the press, good evening. From the Federal Minister of Environment, just a quick update. Um, as we are facing the second wave, of course the Federal Minister of Environment we are continuing to maintain our surveillance desks across the country in the 36 states and FCT, and also maintaining our environmental health sanitation desk in all the 774 local government. We have also commenced uh, registering and training additional volunteers because we don't just keep them in the local government but also in uh, hot spots such as markets, uh, motor parks, train stations and places like that that we feel there is need to actually educate people on uh, adherence to the protocols and the guidelines in containing this uh, virus. Uh, the balance of my remarks will be in Hausa for the purpose of our Hausa listeners. Jamaa uh, assalamu alaikum. Munsake dawa. Ba wana awani de abunda miki magana akane tinda gafaru kwanshi karana. Na ita wana anobar corona. Ta lanta tika dam amata dawa. Kuma wana karama ta dawa da gaya. Baya mana gaya muku cewa wadanda suka fuka muwa ko ta fi musu illa ana maganar dattawa masu shekara 60 zuwa sama ko kuma masu wadansu shututtuka ko cutar hanta ko koda ko wani abu makamancin haka to wannan karan diddigan da muka yi akan yaduwan wannan cutar wannan sabon dawon da tayi daga watan da ya wuce zuwa wannan watan Say muka ga yanzu ta ma zama tsumagiyar kan hanya ta daya rufa da babba wannan kididdigan ya nuna ba kawai kuma dattawa ba har matasa kusan kashi 60 daga cikin ma wadanda suke kamuwa daga farkon wancan watan zuwa yanzu wajen daga shekara 20 har zuwa shekara 40 wadansu ma kasar da haka kuma tana cigaba da kama ma masu dattawa din abinda muke so ku gane shine Tadao, da ma ba ta tafi ba tana nan amma saboda bin dokoki da muke yi na sa wannan takunkumin 
na wanke hannu ko shafa sanadarin da yake kashe kwarin cuta da tazara wajen mu'amila da junan mu da kiyaye shiga rintsin jama'a shi yasa ta fara tafiya to sai muka ga kaman ta tafi muka watsar muka watan garirya da wadannan dokokin to abin da ya dawo da ita kenan ba wani abu ba ga wadanda suka ji ko suka taba sani shekara kusan 100 da suka wuce baya an yi irin shigen irin wannan annoban ba wani abu yasa ta tafi ba a lokacin illa bin irin wa'annan ka'idoji inda mutun zai ga hotunan mutane a lokacin zai gansu da wannan takunkun da maganar wanke hannu din da maganar gudun mutane da dai sauran su to har ila yau ba abin da ya canza ya zama wajibi mu ci gaba da sauran takunkun kuma ba wai ka sa shi sai ka jawo shi ka bar shi a gemu ko ka kawo shi wuya ba a a garkuwan fuska aka ce ko takunkun ba garkuwan gemu ko wuya ba bai da amfani idan ka sa shi anan ko ko a cikin jaka a fuska da hanci ba kuma ka sa a baki sai ka jawo shi sai ka bar hancin ka zike ke a waje da abin da ya wuce kana zuke shi babu amfani baki da hanci za ka rike domin ta nan wannan kwa cutan ta fi shiga kuma tana nan ya zama wajibi mu tashi tsaye tsaye mu ci gaba da bin dokokin nan don mu tabbatar da wannan cutan ta tafi kwanaki na yi kira ga matasa da su taimaka wajen bin dokokin su kan sannan kuma su yi kokari su taimaka ma na kasa da sauran mutane na sama din ma duka da su tabbatar sun yi kuma har ne kira ga cewa ita wannan yayin nan gizo da ake amfani da ita ai matasa kuna amfani da ita ko aika da sakonni a kuma abubuwa to wannan lokaci ne na ai amfani da irin wannan a isar mada al'umman da suke hawa wannan yayin gizo suna mu'amala taro kuwa suna ne biki ne ko menene ka guje shi tafiya ma in ba ta zama maka dole ba kai zaman ka dan wannan dawowan ta fi yaduwa da saurin kama mutane ana rade radin akwai kila wata sabuwa da ta fito a kasan Burtaniya to ba mu da tabbacin ko ta zo nan ko dai ta yi wani abu har yanzu babu wani cikakken bayani amma kara kanmu da wanke hannun nan da gudun shiga rantsi da sauran su shine zai taimake mu saboda haka muna kira ga al'umma si sauri maza maza su ci gaba da mu wa'annan dokoki domin daga wancan watan da yake zuwa yanzu mutanen da suka kamu adadin su a dan lokaci kadan ya fi na watannin baya lokacin da da ta shigo sabuwa ana ganiyan ta har aka yi aka gama wancan karan adadin mutanen suka kamu a rana 1 da 70 ne da 60 yau sai gashi a rana 1 mun samu mutum 2000 45 sai gashi amma ko daya an samu mutum 2500 har da wani abu sun kamu wancan karan ko sai da aka yi wata wajen uku zuwa hudu ba kai 2500 ba to wannan ya nuna cewa ta dawo kuma da gayya to mu ne kadai za mu iya yin abin da zai sa ta tafi amma in ba mu yi ba to Allah ya kiyaye an ce kuma kowa ya ji in kun ya ji dangan jiki ya tsira ai muna ganin mutane suna kamuwa muna jin wadansu suna mutuwa to an ce ne in ka ga gemun dan uwanka ya kama da wuta ka shafa mana ka ruwa to wannan karan ma ba ma shafa ruwa zaka yi ba in ya kama ka aske shi ma ka huta sai kuma ya daidaita Allah ya kiyaye assalamu alaikum thanks so much our minister of environment for bringing our viewers up to speed with developments on covid 19 thanks a million sir for translating all that have been discussed here i know that some of my colleagues here on the live coverage would have some questions now that we have the cmds here with us with the permission of the honorable minister and the chairman questions we are now ready to take your questions please can you come over and take your question we now call on ait
Board Chairman, members of the tax force, my colleagues, good evening. My name is Nancy Oyedia Orom from AIT. I would like to start with the DG of NCDC. So, talking about the new strain of virus, are there specific symptoms we need to look out for? Because we've heard so much. We don't know if it's the usual symptoms of COVID-19. And secondly, what has happened to um, testing 2 million Nigerians in three months? Because it's over 10 months now. We want to know. We're still working with that vision. And the number three goes to the Minister of State for Health. Um, I remember the Minister of um, Health had spoken that we'll be ex uh, expecting our vaccine by the first quarter of next year, precisely the end of January. So I want to know what are the logistics that have been put on ground? I remember he mentioned that uh, these vaccines are stored uh, in a specific refrigerators of about uh, uh, minus 70 and minus 20. Do we have those refrigerators on ground? Because I remember SGF mentioned some time ago that these refrigerators are scarce. So I want to know what is on ground at the moment because January is just around the corner. And um, Finally, still staying with the Minister of Health, State for Health. The COVAX Alliance is only going, is only going to take care of about 20% of the vulnerable population. What are plans to get more? Because at the moment, the way the virus is spreading, everyone is vulnerable. What are plans to get more for every other Nigerian? Thank you. Good evening. My name is Hassan Umar Farouk. I report for Liberty Radio and Television. My question is that to the Chairman and Secretary to the Government of Federation, are also the Chairman of the PTL. Sir, I don't know if you'd like to respond to something that is trending. We are talking about misinforming Nigerians, sir. A state governor is on national television misinforming the public about the national response, about even the existence of this COVID-19. So the more the PTF remains silent, the more doubt will be cast in the minds of Nigerians. Thank you very much, sir. Good evening, all. Rachel Abuja. My question is for the DG NCDC. So uh, we'd like to know what progress your agency have made with developing structure, let's say sustainable structure for health security that will um, last beyond COVID-19. My next question is for the director, hospital service. Ma, you find out that there are a lot of um, so, um, prescription going on on social media where um, people will say there are a list of drugs that doctors allegedly lead doctors giving to patients because of the we because of the overwhelmed hospital and um, what structure we have at the moment now you follow that the patients will tell you i got this from the doctor he sent the list of drugs for me to take and you find out that some someone else is having the sick symptom and the person passed it on we just like to know if it's proper and if you can clarify this thank you very much Good evening, Chairman and members of the PTF. My name is Mitai Rakeben. I report for the NTA. My question is for the uh, Chief Medical Directors in our midst. Uh, in the first wave of this pandemic, if there's anything like that, we discovered that less percentage of uh, cases had need of ventilators perhaps 2% or if not less. But as it is at the moment, we have so much of the cases, up to between 70 to 80% of the cases being very critical and having need of ventilators or ventilation, as the case may be. What is responsible for this? Is it as a result of a new strain? Is, or is it as a result of gaps in uh, case management? What is responsible for this? We'd like to know. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the tax force, my colleagues, my name is Mohamed Salih Nazif. I work for Voice of Nigeria. My question first goes to WHO. Uh, one of the challenges facing the fight against COVID-19, which is very obvious, is infodemic. 
the social media is awash with a lot of counterproductive narratives. There are recently videos circulating emanating from renowned doctors across the world coming up with a discouraging narratives about the vaccines. What is WHO doing concerning this? And how much counterproductive towards the effort WHO is making in fighting COVID-19 across the world? Thank you. That is the outlook for our questions for today. Would first of all invite the Honorable Minister of State for Health, then the DG NCDC would follow. Would also invite the Director of Hospital Services who is here with us today to look at the question. The CMDs that are available here, National Hospital is here, Uni Abuja is here, and FMC Jabi. Any of them could look at the question. Then we would also today take um, WHO, because the question for WHO, and finally the PTO chairman. So may I now invite, please, the Honorable Minister of State for Health to take the podium. Thank you very much to the Chairman, my colleagues, and the House. Thank you very much. The question is from NAMSI, AIT. Uh, essentially, you want to know how far we've gone in terms of um, uh, this vaccine issue. Well, let me say up front that um, the routine vaccines that we've we'll been using, that is for childhood vaccine preventable diseases like polio, like whooping cough, tuberculosis, uh, uh, measles, what have you. These vaccines will be managed by National Primary Health Care Development Agency. So, on ground, they have experience behind them. They have facilities on ground as well. So what we're doing is in raising some committees, like a kind of technical working group that we liaise with our National Primary Health Care Development Agency to look at the vaccines for COVID-19. There are so many vaccines right now, and there are many vaccine candidates that will um, come into the arena. You recall that even as at this point in time, the vaccines being applied, they have not really gone through the whole process. I mean, in terms of uh, giving out, the, I mean, vaccine and monitoring them over a period of time. So that is why, for the respective countries where the vaccines have already been applied, whether in the UK or in the US. They are being applied under emergency use authorization. Now, having said that, what that also means is that if and when we have our own vaccines that we have decided, because as at this point in time, we are yet to take a decision. And we are not constricting ourselves, we are not limiting ourselves as to where we will get our vaccines from. We will look for help where that help is available. So I'm saying that even when these vaccines are available, they still have to be subjected to our own due process of regulation, and that is by NAVDAC. Now having said that, again, in deciding which of these vaccines will suit our own purpose, 
we will consider the factors of um, cost because the vaccines are not free. We will consider the vaccines of logistics in terms of cold chain. Some of these vaccines will need storage of about minus 70 degrees Celsius, some 20, minus 20, and some are the regular, when I say regular, the, the, the temperatures of uh, plus two to plus eight, that the regular vaccines that we use in routine um, immunization, childhood uh, vaccine preventable diseases. Some of them will work in that category. Now, we will also be looking at uh, when we have the vaccines, what segments of the population will take priority. We will look at that. And uh, I think uh, somebody once said that uh, there are six A's involved in um, vaccines. The first is availability. If it's available, is it accessible? That is uh, in accessibility. If it's accessible, is it affordable? If it's affordable, is it ac acceptable? Because already, we, even when the vaccines are not even available, we are seeing um, what appears to be vaccine hesitancy. That is, oh, do we even want to take these vaccines? And it's not limited to here in Nigeria or in Africa, even over there. This issue of vaccine hesitancy is there. Then, of course, the issue of administration of these vaccines in terms of, because even when we purchase the vaccines, you know that um, if you have 100 vaccines, for those that we have right now, that would be for 50, because the vaccines will be administered twice at the interval of about three weeks to four weeks. So all these issues are there, and of course there is also the issue of vaccine accountability which must be taken on board and factored in in whatever uh, we're trying to do. So that's why we have this technical working group looking at all the issues. And of course, the, the, the issue of safety and efficacy. These are some of the issues that NAVDAC will also have to look into. Yes, there have been cases where some unusual reaction, which may not be anything unusual as well, in, in drug administration. Uh, what we call idiosyncrasies, it may not be something that is, you know, widely known in terms of reaction, but it could just be a reaction in one or two or a few individuals expressing. These are some of the issues that will have uh, to be taken on board. But having said that, what is not in doubt is that we need these vaccines. And we are working uh, with all relevant agencies. Uh, you mentioned the COVAX group, which is uh, being uh, managed, uh, being modulated, so to speak, by Gavi. Gavi is a global alliance for vaccines and uh, immunizations. And of course, the, the WHO is also in that picture which the, the whole asset, the, the, the COVAX facility, is to ensure that uh, there is some degree of, uh, you know, uh, equitable distribution of these vaccines so that no country is left behind. And uh, a situation where some countries are already buying up vaccines, even more than required in their uh, uh, domain, is a uh, gives cause for me for concern. And what COVAS facility has given to us is, I mean, to assure us for at least 20 to 20 percent of the vaccine requirement. So which means the, that is excluding, of course, the logistics factors and the, because when you get the vaccines, you need syringe. You need other things to, to, uh, to administer these vaccines. So we will pay for, for that. But we have to make our projections 
as to the number and for us to achieve herd immunity we will need to, va to vaccinate uh, nothing less than 70 percent of the population so if you make that projections you will know that uh, we have uh, you still have many rivers to cross you know so to speak um, I think uh, I have answered your question. Unless there is something that I have missed out, then I will be willing to, to talk about that. But if not, I stop here. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, I think Nancy, your question was on um, if the new variant is associated with different symptoms. Um, no, the new variant is not associated with any difference in symptoms, difference in severity, difference in outcome. The single difference that we found is that it's more transmissible from one person to the other. And therefore, obviously, at some point the numbers add up. You have more cases and it becomes a bigger burden to the health system because more cases end up in hospital. The proportion of people that are severe has been fairly constant around the world. And so the, what I said earlier, really, we are seeing an increase in cases now. Uh, last week we had the highest number of cases ever. Two weeks time, we will see the, it happen in severe cases and deaths. They always lag by a couple of weeks, and that's really why we're focusing so intensively on case management, because the in the inevitable consequence of an increase in the number of cases is an increase in the number of severe cases. And so we have to prepare for that. But in terms of the new variants, there's no difference in presentation. It's the same thing, loss of smell, loss of taste, uh, fever, uh, breathing difficulties for severe cases. So it's exactly the same uh, group of symptoms. You also asked about our testing numbers. Yes, we haven't hit our two million target. We've tested just under a million uh, right now, but that doesn't include the about 80,000 tested within uh, National Youth Service uh, camps. It doesn't include about 200 tested from travel-related uh, tests. Uh, so yes, we're we not where we want to be, but we've pushed very aggressively through the year, and we will keep pushing in the new year when we um, push further, especially with the rapid diagnostic test kit for which we've just gotten approval for WHO a month ago, and we're go currently going through a significant procurement process uh, supported by the Global Fund to increase our access to rapid diagnostic test kits across the country. So Rachel, you asked about how we are using this opportunity to strengthen health security across the country. I think this is our biggest challenge as a, a country. Uh, I'll answer your question in three critical areas. One, in treatment centers for infectious diseases. We have started a national rollout of infectious disease treatment centers. We've commissioned one at the University of Abuja Teaching Hospital, uh, in the Bingham University in Joss, and in the Federal Medical Center in Kefi. There are 17 of these facilities at different stages of completion across the country. So quietly we're transforming the landscape for the treatment of infectious diseases. For the diagnostics of infectious diseases, we have a similar program for labs in focusing also beginning with federal teaching hospitals and uh, tertiary uh, federal medical centers and teaching hospitals. We have one at the uh, University of Abuja Teaching Hospital completed in Elohim, completed in FMC over So the same way we're going around the country, putting these facilities next to the treatment centers so that we have uh, bring diagnostics closer to the patients in all our tertiary hospitals. The third aspect is in emergency operation centers. Those will be focused mostly within the state governments, within the state ministries of health. Uh, so again, we've uh, supported every state to bear two. Uh, Ogun and uh, Jigawa are now the last two states that will have UC. So quietly, we're transforming health security in the country uh, using the challenges that we're faced to build for the future. And uh, what the chair of the Presidential Task Force has assured us, that we have to make health security a national security issue. 
uh, because that is what it is. Uh, nothing else has uh, had the impact of the, of the economy uh, globally this year. In fact, for our lifetimes, like uh, this pandemic. So health security has become a national security issue and something that we have to devote the necessary resources to, to make sure that, yes, new infectious diseases are inevitable, uh, maybe new pandemics are inevitable, but we can prevent them having the impact on society that this one has had in, uh, in Nigeria and across the world uh, this year. So I think as we move uh, into 2021 and uh, hopefully have access to vaccines soon, uh, the next challenge is to make sure that we're much better prepared for a similar threat in the future. Uh, thank you. I want to thank Rachel for this question on self-medication, which I believe it's giving me an opportunity to ventilate the concerns of the PTF, particularly the chairman and the honorable ministers of health. Getting prescriptions via phone or email amounts to self-medication because you have not been examined. The person that gave you the prescription, you cannot even confirm the authority with which he or she is giving the prescription. And was there any examination? Was there any medical history taken before the prescription was given? We know how we handle our medical history in this part of the world. A lot of cases that we are having, even the fatalities we are recording, many of them denied even the health workers their medical history. And that has made the provision of optimal care to be given, to be, to be, not to be given. Now, I will want to address the issue of the protocols. We have the national guidelines, treatment guidelines. In fact, we have reviewed it four times. And we have it on the website of the Federal Ministry of Health, as well as the website of the National Center for Disease Control, Nigeria Center for Disease Control. We have been training the case managers nationwide on the implementation of the treatment guidelines, including domestication at the sub-national levels. The Honorable Minister of State talked about the two commodities that have been proven to be efficacious in the management of COVID-19. Apart from that, which are, the, apart from those, the oxygen, medical oxygen, and the use of dexamethasone, globally, the treatment management of COVID-19 is largely symptomatic. And it can only be managed when the caregiver has a good history, your medical history, and takes thorough examination. And we have always, with the directive of the Honorable Minister, been ensuring that we keep the advisories out there to all case managers nationwide. So we don't expect that anybody will be treating themselves at home, except you are under the home care team, which brings me to the issue of the home care protocol. The teams are actually under the supervision of case management team leads, that are located in the health facilities to the extent that if there is any need for you to be transferred, to be referred 
it will help facility, it will be a smooth transition. And I want to end by saying that beyond COVID, some people may not be killed by COVID, but the way they manage their COVID may end up killing. So it is advisable that you don't spoil your liver, you don't spoil your kidney, you don't spoil your organs because you want to kill COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much, the Director of Hospital Services, for the enlightenment you have provided. We benefited from that exposition. Well, we've agreed um, that we invite the Chief Medical Directors of the uh, teaching hospitals around us to be here, and they have elected one of them to respond to the question. So we now invite the Chief Medical Director of the University of Abuja Teaching Hospital, Professor Bisala Ekele, to mount the podium. Thank you, sir. The Chairman of PTF, Ministers here present, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, the question to us is that um, if I were to paraphrase it, in the first wave, there was need for ventilators. Now we are in the second wave, whether we need more ventilators. The answer is we do not know yet. But what is certain is all the teaching hospitals and level three treatment centers have ventilators, and when they are indicated, they will be put to use. Let me also add that COVID-19 is primarily a disease of the respiratory tract, and therefore, depending on the degree of severity, there might be need to support the patient with oxygen. And in the various treatment centers, we have different devices that we use to support the patient with oxygen. Simple ones like nasal catheters, face masks, refrigerator bags. It's when all of those fail, and depending on the SpO2 level, that we now think of the ventilators. So that most of the patients that need oxygen really do not need the ventilator. But when it is indicated, we shall put them to the ventilator. Thank you very much. Chairman of uh, the PTF, and Secretary General of the Government of the Federation, member of PTF, ladies and gentlemen uh, of the press, good evening. Uh, thank you for the journalists from Voice of Nigeria that asked the question about uh, um, the perception and action by WHO in the face of uh, multiplication of um, videos with a negative narrative on uh, vaccine. Um, what I can say, and that we, as we emphasize since the beginning of the pandemic, there are two crises going side by side. There is the pandemic itself with the virus. And there is the infodemic, which is a multiplication, overload of information through information and fake news. And as you know, fake news spread even faster than the virus itself. It spread faster than news train, the fake news, because they create sensation. They create curiosity. The video you mentioned may well fall into that category. But as you know, WHO has advised since the beginning to fight both the virus and the pandemic with the same methodology. The same way we use science and epidemiology to tackle the, the, the virus at different stage in different countries in the world, WHO had advised that we also tackle infodemic the same way. We need to constantly look at the source of information. 
we need to look constantly on the credibility of that information. We need to analyze information before spreading it. We've heard before, you know, shared for what that is received without any checking. By doing so, we are contributing to the, the crisis. And WHO has established indeed a whole team at all level, at headquarter, in the region, at country level, to study all sorts of information coming in regarding this pandemic. There is a WHO, if you go on the WHO website and you type EPWIN, EPI, W I N, it will give you access to a site with all credible information about everything that is being done on this pandemic. I'll urge you, I'll encourage you to visit that site. In addition, as you know, WHO has entered into partnership with um, several media outlets and several of these uh, platforms and network. For example, during this festive season, WHO has entered into partnership with YouTube to be relaying uh, credible information. WHO has done the same with Google, Instagram, and others. There are some sites like Facebook where if you put some of this information, they will take it down. It's part of the effort WHO is doing to make sure that people receive the best information, the most credible information. And WHO based inter its intervention on science. We use science to then inform risk communication strategies before devising key messages that are then relayed to the, to, to the public. But I want to, to, to emphasize here is that it's our collective responsibility. We shouldn't be spreading news without verifying them. Yes, there is concern about vaccine, there are all sorts of video, but we need to use the same principle. What's the source? Is information credible? What evidence is out there? And most importantly, how to address it? Thank you. Thank you very much, WHO Rep in Nigeria. You've just taken us through a course in mass communication, mass Com 101, credible source of information. Thank you for reminding us once again. My colleagues in the media are quite familiar with this. May we now invite, please, the chairman of PTF and the secretary to the government of the Federation to please come for closing remarks. Thank you, sir. Well, very difficult times, I'm telling you. Uh, I was just reading a text that just came in now. A very good friend of this government who was being cared for in one of our facilities just passed on at 6.30 p.m. So what do we do? It's no joke. We can't play games with this. I'm back to your question, Farouk. Misinformation. In the last nine months, under my leadership, we've tried as much as possible to steer the PTF away from unnecessary controversies. Because it doesn't pay. You end up wasting valuable time addressing matters that do not in any way enhance the national response. So we try as much as possible to avoid controversies and unnecessary distractions. Two, to remain focused on the national response because that is our responsibility. To work with science and facts and provide relevant information for the people of Nigeria to take 
personal responsibilities and to make appropriate decisions for their actions to save lives and livelihood. And I can tell you without any fear or with all form of modesty, our national response has been adjudged as successful by international organizations, by our donor partners, by friends that have supported the national response to the extent that the entire world today is copying our protocols that we had in place several months ago. It is today that some nations are talking about testing and demanding PCR test results either for inbound flights or outbound flights. Farouk, uh, when, when did we place that? Several months ago. It's part of the protocol we put in place to ensure that we protect our citizens. And like I said, our national response has been adjudged to be successful. Even the media itself has adjudged our national response to be successful. Because with a population of over 200 million people, with our broken in health infrastructure over the decades of years, we've been able to tame the virus. What we are seeing today is a result of the fact that we thought the virus had gone, excited about vaccines. We lowered our guard and began to behave in an irresponsible and reckless manner. And that accounts for this new surge in the virus. And the other thing that I want to state is that as part of our national response, we have resourced all the 36 states of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. In terms of grants that have gone out to the states, under the leadership of President Muhammad Buhari, the least amount of money that has been collected by the 36 states is 1 billion naira. The least. President Buhari has resourced the states with about 50 billion naira. Lagos got 10, Kano got 5. 34 of them, I think, got uh, one, got two, and 34, I think, got one, one billion. If you add it up, we're talking about 50 billion naira. All directed at promoting the activities and the response of COVID-19 in the various states. And that was based on the states submitting their incidents action plans, AIPs. What is their incidence action plans? What they are going to do about testing, about treatment, about isolation centers and the rest. And all the 36 states without exception collected the money. So COVID-19 is real. It exists in the 36 states of the Federation plus the Federal Capital Territory. That much you know. Uh, it's just a statement of fact, we are restating it. So I want to assure you that as much as possible, we will remain focused, we will do what we have been charged to do for the overall good of the people of this country. Misinformation is also affecting vaccine hesitancy. And it's not only peculiar to Nigeria, it's all over the world. Even in countries where the vaccines are being developed and manufactured, there's vaccine hesitancy based on misinformation. Most of the viral videos that you have seen all over the news media is generated from these countries where vaccines 
that are being administered or vaccination is going on now. As a presidential task force, we have a responsibility to ensure that we secure for the people of Nigeria vaccine that is effective or efficacious, a vaccine that is readily available, a vaccine that is cost effective, because we know we don't have the kind of resources that most of the major players have. So we'll study whatever is available through partnership and coordination by the WHO or COVID and secure vaccines for the people of Nigeria. Before then, we have a responsibility to embark on mass sensitization of the people of Nigeria as to the fact that these vaccines are safe, they are effective, and a combination of vaccines and the non-pharmaceutical interventions will prepare us to get to the level of herd immunity and get protected and our people secured as we do that. The other thing that I want to emphasize and restate, as part of our attitude, and that's why oftentimes you see we try to avoid any controversy, is because we have a responsibility. We are talking about people's lives. If it was a political matter, we can engage in any form of controversy. But you are talking about people's lives. One life loss means that a breadwinner in a home might not be available. A mother to care for children would not be available. A brother, a sister, a prospective leader, an inventor would not be available. So we are very careful and measured in our approach and we will remain so. And the fact of it, I've learned a lesson from the American election. That conspiracy theories abound and they keep flying as to whether this thing is being done right or this thing is being done like this or this thing would, would, would better be approached like this. But one of the obvious lessons that I have learned is that as much as conspiracy theories abound for every effort of government, that would not stop the success. It did not stop Joe Biden from winning the American election, as much as conspiracy theories were being bandied around. Conspiracy theories would not stop the presidential task force from being focused and succeeding at the work that we've been given. I would end tonight with a quotation from the Director General of the WHO. I saw this, I think he made that remark last week. And I think it's very instructive why he said that I'm referring to Dr. Pedros, the DG of the World Health Organization. Why he said, and I quote, we are asking everyone to treat the decisions about where they go, what they do, who they meet as life and death decisions because they are, end of quote. What you do, with who you meet, where you go, and what you do with yourself, during these moments of festivities, treat that as a life and death decision, because they are. At the meeting, we were talking about how to help the gentleman that just passed. This afternoon, we were discussing because he's a friend to a lot of members of the presidential task force, and we were talking about it. 
about the need for oxygen, about the need for this. Where do we get this? Make sure that all the patients or all the patients in the various facilities are well cared for. We came down from my uh, uh, boardroom for this press conference, just for a message to come in. That everything we spoke about, how you could be aided and assisted, has come to a halt because he has passed on. It's real, people are dying. As a matter of fact, I can tell you, I have lost more close friends in the month of December from COVID-19 than from March when the presidential task force came into effect to the month of November. December is not over yet, but I've lost more close friends. In numbers, I'm not talking about whether I had lost close friends. I've lost colleagues and friends during the first wave. But in this few weeks, and by the time I counted under my roof, not those outside, nine plus three outside, 12. And you begin to think that it's a joke. Let's get serious. And let's have Nigerians understand that we are at a prelude and we need to get serious with our response to COVID-19. I wish you a very great and wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, the Chairman of PTF. Indeed, we are in perilous times. Thank you for always bringing the reality of COVID-19 to stay us in our very face. The Chairman of PTF, sir, today we're honored by having the Permanent Secretary Federal Minister of Health with us, Abdulaziz Nashi Abdullahi. We're also blessed today to have uh, the Secretary of Health, FCT, Dr. Mohammed Kau, as well as the Dr. Asad Hassan, the Deputy Incident Manager on the PTF in the Office of the National Coordinator. They were all here with us. Well, we want to drive on the message for some of our viewer and listener who may have missed out on some of the very important points that have been raised at today's discussion. And to do this, may I please invite the Permanent Secretary General Services Office, Office of the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Dr. Nandi Morris Berry, to please have the floor. Prem Sexa. The Chairman PTF and the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Honorable Minister of State for Health, my colleague and brother, the Permanent Secretary, uh, not forgetting our guests here today, the Medical Directors, Chief Medical Directors of our uh, 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 Medical uh, Hospitals uh, here in Abuja, and the Secretary of uh, Health for STT. Other members of the PTF here present, gentlemen of the press, good evening everybody. Uh, thank you so much, the Chairman, for your very kind word of advice. Uh, we want to remind Nigerians that we still continue to caution that the second wave of the pandemic is here with us, going by the increasing, uh, rising cases of uh, transmission. From the SGF's remarks, we realized that out of 100 tests conducted, about 16 uh, test positive. So that calls for a serious concern, and it means that we have to be more cautious in our dealings. To that extent, uh, steps have been advised to, because of the increasing wave, open up their testing facilities open up their treatment facilities to be able to match with the upsurge. Um, for returnees too, we've been advised, please endeavor to do your post-arrival tests at day seven. It's very important. 
this will help to save lives, save the lives of your loved ones around you. As we continue to celebrate this during this season, you are advised, please, stay away from large congregations. Avoid large crowds. Avoid attending to so many events. That is one way you can save your life beyond 2020. If you must celebrate, please be advised to celebrate responsibly. And of course, if you have not traveled by now, the season is almost over. It's advised that you stay back. Enjoy yourself here. You have a few days to the next year. Uh, traveling may not be the best at this time. And then, of course, if you've traveled already, you are advised to play safe while in your trip. We've been told by our sister, the uh, director from the Ministry of Health, that you have to be cautious the way you manage this virus in you, so as not to kill your vital organs through self-medication. Of course, you've been reminded that picking up prescriptions from the social media amounts to self-medication and that can be dangerous. Please endeavor to live beyond COVID. Finally, avoid fake news. You might be causing more harm to an already harmed situation. Until we see again, I want to wish you all a happy celebration and of course, a self transition to the year 2021. God bless all Nigerians. Thank you.